give sure. you get no your permission before I do anything. No problems. With it. Yeah. So um, yeah, please tell me, and, 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 and I'll kind of let you know what I'm interested in, but yeah. you might want to get, tell you what. Well, all I can do is I just thought it was worth letting you know what are the things that have made Lunar Analytics um, useful and yeah. people are really, really willing to use them. So one of the big things we did was um, in Moodle we created something known as the Student Engagement Report. Yeah. The Student Engagement Report divided quite clearly what was active learning versus passive learning. Yeah. And it meant from a teacher's point of view that when an auditor came in, that, uh, the, the data was used in a way that it should have been, audit became secondary rather than... Um, Primary. Okay, I mean, I'm interested in that because that was one of the things I was interested in asking you about. Yes. Yeah. How has it made a difference as a bet organisation? Well, I'll give you a really yeah. good example. Last year we had a massive audit and the people that were using what we call the dashboards, and I'll show you the dashboards, yeah. um, that they had their audit data over to them within an hour and those that weren't using it were still there at 10 o'clock that night. Yeah. So that word went around yeah. the whole institute in the speed of light and so what I did was I created, and I'm going to show you some of these pickies. What I, show, what I did was I started to think about um, disruptive technologies. I'm really interested in disruptive technologies, and I call um, disruptive pedagogies too, yep. where we can start to build solution-based products for pr uh, problems that people often don't know or can't articulate are actually a problem, right? Yep. So what I did was about, you might have even been there, I was at um, oh, Moodle Mood about two and a half, three years ago. Someone did this fantastic presentation. I looked at it and I went great idea and then present, proceeded to create this dashboard project and this has changed the way we do all our analytics completely. Yeah. Uh, let me just find it. Do, do, do. I'm not going to last year's. Um, okay, this will be a good one. Right, so so a couple of different things we did around the data. One was yeah. we tracked the student experience and yeah. then what we did. So this is here, have a look out. Yeah. See the student dashboards here yeah. and the teacher dashboards. Have you seen these? Yeah, I have seen them. Okay, so what that did was that meant that we could go through and we could track who'd actually done them. What we could also do is we could track what information was being put up there. What that then fed into was the student engagement reports, yeah. which meant if they had their audit data there, it was perfect. Yeah. That was fantastic. But what that also then grew into was we then have created a dashboard for resource development, which we can track that data. And then the third part is we're now tracking data around um, uh, assessments and validation and yeah. grade book usage. Yeah. So straight away you've got this whole integrated approach where the, stu where the teachers can self-serve all of this data, yeah. right? All self-serve. Mm -hmm. That meant that when the audit came through, because the dashboards gave a consistent approach for the students because they really wanted the you know, consistency approach, they really wanted the, yeah. um, you know, basically the focus on assessments and feedback, so we were able to answer what the students wanted. Yeah. It also meant that that data, when it came to audit, they put the report up, the teacher would go, that's the payoff for me. Yeah. The big payoff for me is it's really easy to update it every six months, but the big payoff is I don't have to be stressed out of my brain every time an order comes because it's mm. there. Mm. First time we ran the uh, student engagement reports with Andrew created, um, it divided the active learning versus the passive learning. That whole how many times have they clicked on the course yeah. is irrelevant, yeah. but I can show you some samples of those student engagement reports. What we also were able to do is that then meant we could pull all of that data from the dashboards in, and this year we've just launched the student at risk dashboard. Yep. Student at risk dashboard takes in our SAT online roles, it takes in the dashboard data, assessment downloads, assessment completions, and it means on a daily basis the teachers can check which students have disengaged both either from a face-to-face -face point of view, an online point of view, and from engagement, which we'd say assessment production. Yeah. So it redlines, it produces very quickly data that tells us if, if a student is at risk, and yep. retention is so critical now. Yep. particularly around funding, but also mm. for lifelong learning opportunities. Mm. We're able to pull that data together really quickly. The second part of the learner at risk tool we actually developed was we're taking heat stamps on current courses and identifying what the students actually use within the courses. Yep. And I love this sort of stuff because it's the students voting with their feet. Mm. Mm. And when you go to a teacher and you talk about what they're designing, we can tell them where the students are actually looking. Yeah. What a surprise. Assessments, mm. assessment feedback, videos, yep. mm. active learning. Yep. So you can produce your 286 pages of boring crap and they're just not going to touch it, Howard. You know that, I know that. Yeah. But we can now actually provide that data and it's yeah. now informing our learning design process. Sure. So a lot more pathways approaches. Yep. So that data's been fantastic. Just I've got to say that's been brilliant. The other thing is some of the old stuff we've done, which we're still using, and I'll just open this up for you. I've got so many different PowerPoints here and I've just got to remember which ones I've put what in. It's terrible, isn't it? 
this one probably the good one. No, that's Lilydale. Is this the Lilydale? I might find ITE. ITE was a good one. Sorry, I do so many presentations now. I feel like I'm a dancing fairy. You know, what I do is I run around and present. Here we go. ITE is um, the big Singaporean um, tape system. Yep. We have a really strong partnership yep. with. So I'll open this up and I'll show you. So the data that we still continue to collect. Um, come on. Open up. So we've still got all the you know, normal data. Yeah. So this is just a sample of all the reports they can pull down. So yeah. this one, um, we don't use these anymore because it, it I think the thing I'd say with Lunar Analytics, two to three year time frame, yeah. um, it'll die, come up with different analytics because analytics can be used to drive change. Yeah. So um, some of the changes we've driven this year was a focus back in 2011 to 2014 yeah. and that was changing the paradigm from passive learning to active learning. Yeah. So what I did was I produced those reports for the senior educators and the managers yeah. and this is an example of, um, I think it was um, ITE or business, mm -hmm. it was predominantly passive and then within a year of those continuous conversations we'd gone, we had 1,000, I think it was 1,132% increase in assessments and forums being used. Yeah. So it just it drove that change with very little um, point, finger pointing or forcing. Yep. Yep. Teachers are so, if the students vote, I would say the data we generate that's most valuable is the students' opinions, and that's where GPS comes in. GPS we pull data from as well, Howard, yep. and that asks the students what they expect and what they mm -hmm. want. Mm -hmm. And so that data you then take the teaching centres, and if the students' focus is on assessments and active learning, yep. you don't have to tell the teachers what to do. Yep. They want to hear their students' voice. One thing they've all got in common is mm -hmm. they want to do the right thing by their students. So this data, we stopped doing that last year, and so what we've replaced that with now is, um, I'll show you another example, the Teaching and Learning Symposium, yeah. Teaching and Learning College. Let me just have a look. Actually, no, I should go back, go back, go back. This is the easy way to do it. So this has been a massive change. We're now, most of the projects we work on, according to the CEO, um, is change management. Our job is change, min and change management and um, cultural change. That's what he believes our area does and does really, really well, which yeah. is fantastic. That's true, yeah. Um, so what we have in the Teaching and Learning College now, which we launched last year, is not just a video wall and just-in-time training and all the rest of that. But we now, for example, last year I launched a major project for Lilydale. We've done yep. polysynchronous learning environment out at Lilydale. Yep. So we've got um, links um, working with WizIQ, working with a, a full blended learning model, which means what, what I've done is I've gone and met with each of the centres, unpacked each of the courses, identified what needs to be done in the workplace, what can be done in the classroom, what can be done online, yep. what can be done polysynchronously, and what has to be done with a teacher in place. Unpacked all that, yep. created pods around practical so we can have split classes across three locations. That yep. It's just, it's mm. brilliant, it's really good. A lot of learning to happen. But I had six weeks working with the team to design the whole campus yep. around the polysynchronous environment. Then I had to design an education model that would work within that environment. I was given one parameter and it had to be video conference. Um, no negotiation, um, which is a challenge for our kinesthetic visual learners who, mm -hmm. you know. Then what we had to do is we had to upskill 286 staff. Yep. Originally it was only 60 staff we were going to upskill, and um, we ended up with 286 staff attend, which was phenomenal. So I divided into three groups, which was um, introducing the models, that was around pedagogy, the educational rationale, introducing the models, talking about you know newest ways of learning and teaching, and stories, stories from the teachers that are doing it well. Mm -hmm. Second one was around the actual tool, I oh, know it was around rapid onboarding for the students, so around the students' experience, mm -hmm. and I introduced something called the educational concierge, yep. um, which no one I know of has used in the same way that we've done it, which means there's a there's a qualified teacher out there who's a generalist and they do a personalised learning approach for every single student. Yeah. They create an individual plan for each of them, they rapidly onboard them, generic competencies, awesome. yeah. um, GPS, ASAR, and they meet with them on a monthly basis. Yeah. They're not a subject matter expert, no. they're not from biotech, they're not from electrical, yeah. but they're a teacher. You know Joan? 
Yeah, Remember Jack? Yeah, she's one of our educational concierges. She's yeah. Oh, she's fantastic. She's really good. They also support the technology, and if there's a student out there in one or two, they'll actually sit in the, with there and give them that yeah. social psychology experience and yeah. help them. So that was, and part three was the actual technology. Last but not least, so we set up a simulated environment. Julianne did a great job working with IT. And we set up a prototype of um, yeah. R2D2, which was a, we put it, I put everything on trolleys. Yeah. So big, yeah. big screen. Yeah. Um, Echo 360, yep. um, a computer, and it can be pushed around from room yep. to room, so it's flexible. It was only yesterday we finally got the solution actually where we needed it to be. So the teachers came through and did all that training, but 286 of them. But the thing was, it wasn't just about learning about the new Lilydale model, yep. it was around actually getting them to think completely differently. Now the reason I'm showing you this is it then meant that I could, for example, tell you at any given time, I'm not sure if this is going to work because so we've just completely gutted student web because we've had such a massive reorg. No, it's not going to work, bugger. Let's see if I've got a good example of it. Oh, that's the learner at risk stuff. Let me see if I've got an example. So anyhow, the reports went out to all the centre managers and it literally had every teacher who's done what training and where. And so every year now I work with Jennifer and usually I pick the three PD programs to create the biggest change. Yeah. So a bit like what you're doing yeah. with those sessions, you might say that's compulsory for all the teachers, yeah. and then you track who attends and who doesn't. Mm. You send it through the centre managers, so they've got the knowledge around who's actually part of this change agent program. Yeah, interesting. So then what it does is it creates a partnership with you and the centre manager, where no longer you're going, you're empowering them yeah. to actually inform their staff around what a priority is. Great. So I still do that mobility and e-learning working party with the teachers, teaching mm. centre managers. And they, I negotiate with them what they see the priorities for my area are. Yep. I tell them what I think they are, and then we have robust discussions. So by the time I launch the major change program, we're all in furious agreement and they feel ownership of it. Mm. A big change from where we started, Wonderful. where I couldn't even get a damn meeting with people. Yeah. Um, so the nice part about this is that um, this particular project here, the teaching centre managers all agreed, we we're going to do pilot projects, all sorts of things, and they all just went, no, just launch it. Just launch it. Mm -hmm. now. Yeah. So in Student Web, and I'll show you here. Um, I'll just do another version of this. Um, it's what we've really worked towards now is self-serving. Heaps yep. and heaps of self-serving. So I'll go into a course and I'll show you some examples. But all of this then pulls through to them being able to pull the data out. Yep. I don't reckon... Well, this isn't going to give me a lot of data, but anyhow, we'll do it. It'll give you an idea. Gee, it's a bit slow today. Mm -hmm. So you can get your ACER report on every single student enrolled yep. in this course, what they've done, what their ACSF level is, yep. how that correlates, whether or not they should be doing this course. Um, their engagement analytics, and I'll open one of those up for you, their evidence of participation data, their individual learning plan they can access, the logs, the live logs, yeah. activity reports, course participation, activity, and we just keep adding to those reports. They can go in at any given time yeah. and access reports of all of the students in their course and in their groups. Yeah. Um, probably 50% of the students love it, um, yeah. uh, the staff, but probably I'd say 30% still aren't using it. Of staff? Of staff, okay. still not using okay. it. So you'll see here, here's your learner at risk data. So here, assessment activity at yes. this stage for this group, zero. Attendance activity, 25%. So that's the rankings. But this is where they're all at, percentages, as they go progress through this course. Yeah. So I can see at any given time, um, the teacher goes in and waits. What the, so they might say classroom participation is worth 50%, yeah. or it might be worth 2%. Yeah. But they can wait it at the start, so then your learner at risk data yeah. is quite, you know, it's quite cool. Now let's have a look at this. So I can go through and work out who the students are. Let's just pick a random. These are the evidence of participation reports. So I don't know what this student's yeah. is. So look, even down to it, you can see what yeah. the feedback yeah, yeah. is, what they've submitted, any active learning they've done. Um, and even in some of them, and I wish I could show you, I don't think this one's going to be able to show us. Um, you can actually click on the teacher's feedback and if it's something in e-portfolios or a Word document, it's all in there and that's what we show to the auditor who loves it. Yeah. Another different report, what's this one? Oh, this is all your um, GPS um, 
and I'm not sure whether or not they will have done this, but anyway, let's give it a whirl. See what we get. It's always fascinating. I should have some default ones, shouldn't I? Let's pick a course, any course. School of Business. Let's just do the whole School of Business. All courses. Let's see what we get. It's always, it's always a bit exciting. Yeah, well, no data. So clearly, I've chosen poorly because that course yeah. was not in business. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, so yeah. you, you can pull all that data through, which is really cool. Um, the dashboards, this is an example of how it embeds within yeah. all the courses. It just sits at the top, yeah. and then you can go in and grab your data. So this one here, the course development, clearly they've finished all the parameters that are required for that course development. So this is what I would say a non-Bells developed course. It yeah. just It's just done really basically in chunks. Yeah. Um, but they have to hit each of those key dashboard requirements. It's really changed the way people are developing things yes. within Box Hill, like yep. significantly. Yep. So, yeah, this one here, you know, uh, the assessment task force not up there, that's cool. The unit outline's not up there. Online yep. activity, there's yep. only one that yep. they have to do. Yep. Um, the other thing that the dashboard's changed in terms of our reporting is um, instead of having 20 assessment tasks, um, you know, we're saying you can have four maximum. And so there's a whole lot of really rich conversations around quality of assessment. So we're not getting this gross over assessment. Yeah. And what we're also have starting to see is that one of the biggest challenges that the Institute faces is around moderation and validation mm. and around the casualisation of the workforce. So in terms of moderation and validation, if the assessment tasks are up there, easy to moderate, easy to validate. Mm. And in terms of casualised workforce, if the teachers are setting these courses up, you've got a consistent approach where you're not getting Aramate or Swinburne or Holmes Glen way because it's all there. But all this data is reportable at director, centre manager and so on. So that's been really good. Yeah. That's, that's been fantastic. The other data, which is really interesting, this is the learner at risk stuff. Gregor's done some great work on that, so is Andrew. Um, this stuff, one of these is just Gizmo. We've just used an existing app. Yeah. Okay. The other one is one that's been customised and created. Yeah. So this, we just, every two to three years, we change what we're reporting in, because I use it to drive change, yep. but the default stuff still stays within student web yep. okay. for analytics. What it also means is when the CEO calls me into his office and tells me what's the usage rates, yep. at any given time, I've got data across the whole yep. institute. Yep. Like last year, I was reporting on, this was really interesting data I was reporting on. I'll have to kill you if you tell anybody, but anyhow, it's worth looking at. It's really interesting. Compared to ours, it's going to be so impressive. But I yeah, but we've had seven years to work on this. Yeah. So I can now tell you percentage of courses with content online, 72.2. Mm -hmm. um, this is meaningful yeah. content. Um, percentage of students using student web, and yep. so this includes our short courses. So. Okay. Um, but, you know, we can report on sort of usage stats, yep. percentage using just to access courses, yep. which is, and that's fantastic. Because in the past, what I was, a lot of people would go into student web and just check their timetable. Yep. I didn't want that data, I wanted to know yep. real yep. courses. Yep. But it means if 72% of courses, then I can hunt down. The difference. Yeah, and some of it is around smart, the complexity is around smart, and it's done Gregor on my head in. You'll have three courses in smart, but it's really the one course, but we're reporting zeros against two of them. Yep. Um, and then here, percentage of students, you know, percentages of staff using student web, and this data is really interesting. Yep. I mean, what the hell are the rest of them doing? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I'll pull reports back now and send it through, mm -hmm. um, and I'll show you something else we do too now. And then around dashboards, dashboards commenced, 90% of all dashboards have been commenced now. Yeah. Message through loud and clear, yeah. they know I'm not going anywhere, back yeah. and down. 20% completed, which is good in a year. That's yeah. major change yeah. in a yeah. year. Yeah. Um, distinct staff access, so tracking through, that's a lot of staff are actually getting in and using it, students, a lot of, you know, that's that's fantastic. That is, yes. So it means it's embedded as part of the culture now, yep. that's nearly every single teacher is using Teaching and Learning College and actually yep. going on and using it, which is brilliant. Student access, really high, we've got up to 5,000 students using it a day, yep. which is, for us, is really high. Here, November, we had... Um, See how you distinct users shall access. Yeah, it's it's huge. But anyhow, so what the really interesting thing is, this is the really, really interesting thing is, is we're now collecting data on every single course, mm -hmm. how many students are enrolling, yep. and 
is, is the staff using it? Is the student using it? So we can now go through every single course and identify those who aren't using student web and find out why. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's become like institute wide. Yeah. Um, everybody's in serious partnership, and then sometimes there's good reasons. Yeah, sometimes here, it will be. Yeah. You know, as to why they're not using it. Yeah. But we can tell you who's using it and where. And then we can also focus, for example, some of these, like the Certificate for in Marketing, they are using it, but we have a combined hub for business, yeah. and they all use that. So you've got 892 students using it. Yeah. There's only 46 enrolled, but it means all the business students are all using the generic competencies yeah. that they've mapped. So, like, some of the data's wrong, So, yeah. but that's okay. We, we, we have a story we can tell. Yes, yes. And the interesting thing is the CEO was happy to sit down and go through all of this. So it's really interesting, interesting data, and I can then work out percentages and give the story that goes with it. So yeah, it's, it's, yeah, yeah. the data's been quite broad now um, and very, very used across the whole institute to the point that I'd now report on a lot of this stuff to the board directly. Yeah, yeah. It's very different from when I first started. Yeah. Great. So. Yeah, it's good. A lot of, lot of different data. Yeah, okay. Is that what you were anticipating? Yeah, yeah. yeah, so I mean, where I want to see where I think it'd be good to speak is just on the, those different levels which you addressed. Yep. Like, what is the impact for students, for individual teaching staff, for yep. program managers, senior yep. managers? All of those. The Absolutely happy to. When do you want me to do it? When do you want to do it? Uh, when are you starting? <laughs> no, it's started now. It's across the year. So, you know. I would suggest that you either have me in the next month or you have me in six months. Yeah, I like the next month idea. Okay, good. Yeah. Well, I'm still at Box Hill. Okay. So let's have a look at, tell me what date and then I'll tell you. This is where it gets tricky for me because. Give me a broad range of dates. I can give you a couple of days. Yeah. Can I do that yeah. uh, when I get back to the, yep. uh, because we've got a couple of other people lined up yep. and um, so when you say within the next month, does that mean by the end of May or when are you? I'm leaving, leaving May the 8th, okay. but Swingburn won't have a problem with me presenting on the topic of Lunar Analytics and I can use yep. Box Hill as part yep. of the example. I will still talk about the same thing. I've put forward um, a very clear vision on where I'm going with Swinburne. Yep. They've just gone, great, next three years planned, tick. Yes. So I can talk about what I've done in the past from Box Hill and yep. I can talk about what I'm planning in the future for Swinburne. Yeah, yeah. So if, if it was either get me out there before May 8th, which is probably not realistic, or get me in... Um, give me two months to get settled and started because okay. the first two months at Swinburne is going to be me benchmarking data. Yeah. My, my biggest job, and I've told David this, is that um, I will have a huge amount of data to share on baseline mm. and then my suggestion is you bring me back in a year's time and let's see if we've done anything. Mm. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So I can share what's been done. Yeah, that's, that's good. Um, so, uh, maybe eight is the colour back then. Okay, I'll see what I can do. But if you can't, don't stress. But no, um, won't, Swinburne won't have a problem with me going. Yeah. One of the things that they really want me to do, and one of the reasons that they've um, been keen to get me on board, is they don't want to stop me presenting to other organisations and doing conferences. They want to build the reputation mm -hmm. of Swinburne yeah. as quickly as possible because it's been pretty quiet for a long time, hasn't it? Yes. So we want to push it back onto the national stage mm. um, as a bit of a shaker and a mover. Very good. David Coltman, do you know him? No. Um, yeah. Unitech, New Zealand? Deputy CEO him. there? Yeah. Yeah, that's where he's come from. Okay. Um, real shaker and mover. Good. And then Simon Ofer from RMIT. Okay. You don't know him. No. no. Really interesting um, group. So. Yeah. So, <laughs> very exciting. But I'd yeah. love to. Thank you for the honour of asking me. Well, we'll try and do it that first week of May. Otherwise, six yeah. months is also good. I mean, oh, no, it can be three months. I yeah. just guess what okay. I'm thinking is, if I, don't, if I do it while I'm at RMIT, if I do it while I'm at Swinburne, I would like to um, then present with something significant to say about Swinburne yeah. because I think then that's vested interest for Swinburne to say yes Yes, yeah. and so if they, they can then be part of the story I'm telling, I can talk about where I've been yeah, and what I did as well. and that works for me, I mean I, I, for me it has to be around that time or it has to be later because I'm going to be away and yeah, so that's cool, yeah, yeah. Yeah. and I'm happy to be flexible with that Howard, you know yeah, that yeah, and it's good. I think it's good we're starting to see um, like I've just had um, William Angles out for three hours yep. and um, presented a whole lot of stuff to him, they got two mil Yep. And they wanted a bit of a strategic overview on how I would spend the money. Yeah, yeah. Happy to do that. But in turn, they're now giving us a huge amount of information on the SMS project. Yep. It's love to see those networks starting to come back again after they got killed off. Mm -hmm. but we're starting to work out how we can help each other again. Mm -hmm. That's nice. Mm -hmm. That's good. Because mm -hmm. our real enemy isn't each other. No. Our real enemy is private RTOs mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and government funding. Yeah. Yeah. That's so. right. yeah. Well, that's good. Sounds like you're really happy there. I am really happy there. It's quite Sounds good. like you found your niche. 
in some ways because yeah, I mean you know me and I like to do different things and it fits um, well enough. It's just good. Yeah, I think it does. Does so. So far, it's been quite good. Yeah, I'm liked and I'm on permanent. Like I've never had a permanent job. Oh um, wow, yeah. that's really good. Yeah. So. Um, at Box Hill, um, just to catch you up, um, we had 62. We had 62 people.